a point of clarification. Uh, last week I might have given the impression, uh, I didn't want to give a wrong impression in regards to witnessing and that if we are not witnessing in a certain specific way, then we can't be saved. Uh, let's put it this way. Well, let's pray first, then I can just try to clarify what I said. Precious Lord, we are amazed at your incredible love. We're so encouraged by Jesus. Lord, because you love us with an everlasting love, you are on a mission, in this to, and you came on a mission, and you're continued through your Holy Spirit on a mission to save everyone. You would not that one person will be lost on planet Earth. And you've made every provision possible uh, that not one would be missing. And so, Lord, may we uh, rejoice in the salvation that you've given us and share that salvation with others so that they too can uh, enjoy uh, a living, loving relationship with you. So bless our time together as we talk about victory in our lives. We pray in Jesus' name. Amen. <clears throat> I think the point I was trying to be made, uh, what I was trying to say was that uh, when Jesus possesses us, when he comes into our hearts and into our lives, that his uh, love will flow out of us. And, he, and we will find ways that uh, he will use us, giving us the various different uh, gifts to touch other people's lives with his love. And uh, so uh, it, our, our salvation is not based on that. But when we're saved in a saving relationship with Jesus, we will look for opportunities to share his love with others. Because it's just Jesus in us, not I, but Christ who lives in me. So I don't want to put, give anyone a guilt complex or whatever, but just ask the Lord, what can I do to share your love with others? And he will show you the way, <clears throat> and you will rejoice. Now this morning, I just uh, want to welcome those who are, who are uh, watching online and uh, we're very happy that you're here with us and uh, we want to I want to share this it's a basically it's a reading it was a little track that Ellen White wrote uh, just before her death it was basically the last track that she wrote and you know you could think that you know her who wrote you know millions of words and thousands of documents and and multiple books that what would she want to write? What, was the, what would be the message she would want to give us at the very end? I know at the last general conference that she attended, uh, she lifted up the Bible. Remember what she said? To you I commend the word of God. Study the Bible. That was her last words, you know, to the, to the group, to the general conference. I commend to you the Bible. Ellen White loved, the, loved Jesus and loved his word and treasured it in her heart. And what would she, you know, she wrote about extensively about Bible prophecy. She wrote, you know, extensively in the great controversy, all the issues around religious freedom and the Sabbath Sunday issue and, and all the different things, you know, the mark of the beast, the seal of God, and there's so many different things that she wrote about and were on her heart that are, you know, vitally important topics to know uh, in these last days, the shaking, the sealing, and all these different areas. What we're studying on Wednesday nights uh, on the little book, Preparation for the Final Crisis, very, very interesting uh, book um, having to do with last day events. But it, when she, the last thing she wrote, and she wrote a letter to someone, and she starts it off in this way. She said, Dear friend, the Lord has given me a message for you, and not for you only, but also for other faithful souls who are troubled by doubts and fears regarding their acceptance by the Lord Jesus Christ. She wanted to make sure that we were not fearful and, 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 and unsure about the fact that Jesus has accepted us. He loves us and has given his life for us. She wanted to make sure that we could be 
secure in Jesus. That was her final heart, was, you know, message to, to those that would hear her, was this message that I'm going to share. Uh, his word to you is, fear not. And let's take this, like, personally, you know, let's take this as a message to us as if, you know, the, the messenger of the Lord, God put it on her heart to write, because I do believe that these same things that this individual was experiencing and that she was writing to encourage, we can all go through a very similar types of, yeah, of concerns and, and fears and uncertainty, you know, in our own walk with the Lord. And so, I'm just going to uh, read this together. Um, so, as she wrote from Isaiah... Uh, as she read uh, from Isaiah 43, verse 1, Fear not, for I have redeemed thee. And I, we talked about that last week, but that's such a beautiful knowledge. It's not like, I will redeem you, but he's saying, I have redeemed you. And that was before Jesus actually came to the earth, because Jesus was called the Lamb of God that was slain from when? from the creation, from the beginning of time, the beginning of the earth, he, from before the earth was even created, he had already redeemed us, you know, for, and, and, and he, he, I have redeemed thee, I have called thee by thy name, thou art mine. That is for Jesus. Jesus is telling us, you are mine. I have redeemed you. I have bought you. You're mine. Don't have doubts. Don't question that. Your desire to please the Lord, you desire to please the Lord, and you can do this by believing His promises. He is waiting to take you into a harbor of gracious experience. He bids you be still and know that I am God. Be still, listen, enjoy my presence. You have had a time of unrest, but Jesus says to you, Come unto me, and I will give you rest. There's no better place to find rest than Jesus, to be in his arms. The joy of Christ in the soul is worth everything. Then are, you glad, are they glad? Because they are privileged to rest in the arms of everlasting love. Put away your distrust of your heavenly father. Instead of talking of your doubts, break away from them in the strength of Jesus and let light shine into your soul by letting your voice express confidence and trust in God. Speak faith, speak trust. Don't let negativity, doubt come out of your mouth or even be harbored in your heart. I know that the Lord is very nigh to give you victory. I say to you, be helped, be strengthened, be lifted out of and away from the dark dungeon of unbelief. When we don't believe, we're in a prison. We are, we are bound and imprisoned. Doubt will rush into your mind because Satan is trying to hold you in captivity to his cruel power. But face him in the strength that Jesus is willing to give you and conquer the inclination to express unbelief in your Savior. So the devil wants us to express unbelief, a lack of faith, and to be fearful to be, uh, you know, to be uh, afraid and not have confidence in him. But Jesus says, face him. Face who? Face the enemy with the strength that Jesus is willing to give you. What text does that remind you of in the book of James? He says, when you are, when the devil comes, when you, what's the, what's the term? He says, submit yourself to God. So when you're tempted, when a trial comes, when a difficulty comes in your life, 
when you're question when you start questioning God and wondering what's going on and starting to weaken your faith your faith is starting to weaken he says submit yourself to God and then resist the devil in the strength that Jesus is willing to give you so we're not resisting in our own strength resist the devil because you've submitted to God you've asked for his strength you've submitted surrendered to him and then Jesus the, the strength that Jesus is willing to give you and and conquer the inclination to express unbelief in this in your Savior but resist the devil and he will do what he will flee he is no match to the weakest of the weakest individual on planet earth who trusts in Jesus but we have to believe that he that with victory is his he has already redeemed us that's good news do not talk of your inefficiency and your defects you despair that when despair would seem to be sweeping over your soul what should you do when 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 despair is sweeping over your soul what should you do look to Jesus saying he lives to make intercession for me so when we look we look to see Jesus in the most holy place of the heavenly sanctuary interceding on our behalf and what is he saying to the father look at Rob he's got enough strength to do it he can beat the devil no he's saying my blood he's saying my merits I cover him with my righteousness Rob has my righteousness he's accepted my righteousness he has none but he's accepted mine and I've taken his sin and I've replaced it with his right with my righteousness praise the Lord we stand against the devil in the righteousness of Christ in the power of Christ so don't talk about your inefficiencies and your defects when despair seems to be sweeping over your soul look to Jesus saying he lives to make intercession for me forget the things that are behind all your mistakes and all your shortcomings forget them believe the promise I will come to you and abide with you God is waiting to bestow the blessing of forgiveness of pardon for iniquity and of the gifts of righteousness and upon all so he's waiting to so he's waiting to bestow the blessing of forgiveness who does he want to forgive every single one of us who does he want to pardon from iniquity every single one of us and who does he want to give the gift of righteousness to every single one of us upon all who will believe in his love and accept the salvation that he offers Christ is ready to say to the repenting sinner behold I have caused thine iniquity to pass from thee and I will clothe thee with a change of raiment the blood of Jesus Christ is the eloquent plea that speaks in behalf of sinners so when we see the blood of Jesus when we behold Jesus dying on the cross of Calvary don't forget it's the love of Christ that leads us to repentance we can't we have no power to repent we couldn't care less about repenting in our own natural being but it's his love and as we see Jesus blood as we see him dying spilling his blood for us it's his blood that speaks eloquently in behalf of us when we see his blood we need to see his forgiveness we see his death and we see our life we see a new life we see us born again because of his blood what he was willing to do on that cross and it wasn't just the shedding of blood but the, what caused the shed the blood to be shed was our sin was laid on him and it would crush out his very being his death was not from the nails his death was from the, our sin and the good news is he took it willingly it's a plea that speaks in behalf of sinners this blood cleanses us from what what does his blood cleanse us from all unrighteousness almost all all we need to make these promises ours 
because God loves us. He doesn't hold anything against us. He wants to pardon everything, wipe it all away. I don't care how many mistakes we've made, you've made, I've made. You know, we can get focused on our, on our weaknesses and our, on, our, on our sins. That's not where we get strength. We get strength from focusing on Jesus. Lay aside the sin that so easily besets you. And what is, the, what is the key? Looking unto Jesus. Point us to Jesus. You know, and it's, in a, in a, it's such a beautiful story in the Old Testament when the children of Israel, after their rebellion, had, and their, their complaining and their backbiting, and they, they were, uh, God permitted, what did he permit, remember? The snakes to come into the camp. When they, when, they pushed, when they pushed him out of their, out of their life and, and he couldn't protect them anymore because he had to give them up because they didn't want him, then he permitted, he allowed, he didn't protect them because they didn't want his protection. They permitted the snakes to come in. These were vipers. These were, these were poisonous, deadly poisonous snakes. And, uh, you know, Becky has a problem because her dog... Has, keeps on getting bitten by, by these little, um, little um, pygmy rattlers. A little buster. Gets, has, he's been bitten twice and by the grace of God he's been, he survived both of those with some help from the vet. Um, and the grace of God, but he has survived. But those were deadly bi snake bites. And the good news is that they were given instructions. All they had to do, remember Moses lifted up, he formed a, a serpent, a bronze serpent on a, on, a, on a pole. He lifted it up, he said, all you have to do is look and you will live. You have to have enough faith to simply look. You're dying and if we just look, you will live. You know, looking onto Jesus, the author and the finisher of our faith. What a wonderful Savior. Look and live. Look and live. Trust him. Come, let him take all the garbage of your life. And it's a lot. It's overwhelming. But, you know, we cannot be overwhelmed by the garbage. What we can be overwhelmed by is his love that he takes us. There's no one he would ever push away out of, out of, our, out of his life. There's no one who's sinned too much, who's been too evil, that cannot be forgiven and as we look to Jesus. He cleanses us from all iniquity. It is our privilege to trust in the love of Jesus for salvation in the fullness, in the fullest, surest, noblest manner to say, He loves me. He receives me. I will trust Him for He gave His life for me. Just believe everything He says in the Word and claim it for your own because it's for you and it's for me nothing so dispels doubt as coming in contact with the character of Christ and how do you get in contact in contact with the character of Christ how do you do that you've got to through prayer and through the word you've got to take this precious word and see it as, as Jesus' word. In the beginning was the word. The word was with God. The word was God. And all things were made by him. When we spend time with the word, we're spending time with our creator, our redeemer, and our very best friend. And uh, I enjoyed quite a few of the programs the special evangelistic series that uh, AWR has been doing, AWR forward slash Bible, or go to the AWR site, and Cammie, uh, uh, I always get her name wrong, Cammie Ottman, I think his name is. Wonderful evangelist, I mean amazing evangelist. And she's telling story after story of people's lives transformed, and that's the power of that series, because she goes around She's um, the vice president of, of um, Adventist World Radio. And Adventist World Radio goes to places that no one else can go. People don't have TV. They don't have a satellite. They don't have any of those things. And the vast majority of people in the world don't have any of that. 
And so that ministry reaches out to those people in North America and Europe and in, you know, in the more affluent places we have access to these things. But in those places, a little radio is a great privilege and a great, a great, um, you know, a great, a great thing. And so anyway, you can go on and her 360 programs and tell all kinds of stories. But there's so many stories, uh, like for instance, the series, uh, a story about um, Grilla up in the Philippines, the special uh, Grilla force that, it, that um, have killed many, many hundreds of individuals. Uh, and, and, and including one young man who was an assassin that learned at 14 he was he killed the very the first time and he became I forget the name they called him but he was a he was a killer and they sent him on missions to kill to kill to kill to kill and you know he would kill and and he and one the last person he killed was a pastor who was begging for his life and he took that gun because he always did what he was told and he shot him dead but he could not get that out of his mind. He could not get it out of his mind. And uh, somehow he went home and his, and his wife and his children were at home because that was his job. He was a, he was a terrorist, he was, a, he was a, you know, a, um, a rebel. And he went home and his wife was listening to Adventist World Radio. And as a result of that through, and you can watch the program, uh, he became, he gave his life fully to Christ. And, uh, and he's serving the Lord now. I don't know how they dealt with all of his murders in the past. I don't know how that, but God will take care of however, however he decides to do that. But hearts can change. Hearts that are just so full of hate and so full of evil can totally turn around. How? Through Jesus. Through Jesus. Through the wonderful gospel of Jesus Christ, the everlasting gospel. And so we are so thankful today that we have Jesus to look to. And Ellen White really encouraging us. The last track she ever wrote is to look to Jesus. That is the bottom line. The privilege. He receives me. He loves me. He receives me. I will trust him for he gave, me, he gave his life for me. We've got to make that our own. It's got to be personal. It's not just a theory. It's a real personal thing. It's for Jesus has come into my life. Nothing so dispels doubt as coming in contact with the character of Christ in his word. He declares, him that cometh to me, I will in no wise cast out. That is, there is no possibility of my casting him out. For I have pledged my word to receive him. Anyone who comes, even a terrorist murderer, even Paul the apostle, who had, had, uh, who had was part of murdering many, many people. Uh, you know, David, who was a, an adulterer and a murderer, came, you know, finally met Jesus, you know, and was forgiven. So there's no sin that's too far down the road. You're not too far down the road. I don't care who you are. You're not too far down the road. Jesus will take you right where you are. And uh, other stories, uh, Cammy's stories of going into prisons, and uh, meeting with men on death row and giving them hope, giving them Jesus. And, and the prisons wanting, uh, wanting AWR, because they're all listening to AWR in the prison. The whole prison changes. They are giving their lives to Christ. All the prisoners are changed. And the, the, they don't have to be worrying about them trying to escape and, and, and killing each other and all that. The whole prison transformed because of Jesus. That is amazing. So does, does Jesus work? Does, does he change lives? Absolutely. In Umatilla? Absolutely. In Altoona? Absolutely. In Eustis? Absolutely. In, in Mount Dora? Absolutely. In Eustis and Tabaris? He does too. <laughs> in Zellwood? He does too. You know, he changes lives if we'll just simply believe what he tells us. Is Jesus true? He, so she carries on. He pledges, he says, uh, for I have pledged my word to receive him. In other words, us. Take Christ at his word and let his lips declare that you have gained the victory. So let your lips declare that let your lips declare that you have gained the victory. So if you're struggling with something in your life, we are to, we have already been redeemed from that sin. 
or sins or lifestyle. And we already have the victory. We have to claim that victory and thank God for it and believe God for it. Is Jesus true? Does he mean what he says? The answer is decidedly yes. Every single word. So as the old saying goes, if the Bible says it, I believe it and that settles it. Settles it for me. And I like that. Settles it for me. Because it's got to be personal. Uh, now Cammie says something in that, that her presentations, uh, something along the line of, if the Bible says it, I believe it. If it doesn't, then it's not for me. If it, if, it, if it agrees with the Bible, I believe it. If it doesn't, I want nothing to do with it. That idea, God's word, we can believe it, every single word. If, then if you have settled this, by faith claim every promise that he has made and receive the blessing. Can you see how important it is to spend time with Jesus in the word? If we're neglecting taking time with Jesus in the word, we won't have the faith because we don't have the access. We, the promises are not on our heart. We're not thinking of these things. And so consequently, we, are, we have no power. And we will always end up going down the road, whatever that temptation comes. We won't have the faith to submit to God. We won't resist the devil. And he, and he won't flee from us. He'll, just, he'll work to try to take us away from Jesus and destroy us. For this acceptance, so, so by faith claim every promise that he has made. Receive the blessing. For this acceptance by faith gives life to the soul. You may believe that Jesus is true to you. Even though you feel yourself to be the weakest and the most unworthy child. Could Satan give us that impression that we're weak and unworthy. And as you believe, all your dark, brooding doubts are thrown back upon the arch deceiver, who is a liar, because you are not a, a hopeless case. Jesus has bought you back, redeemed you with his blood, paid the price for you. You are his, and you are victorious. The arch deceiver. Um, you, can, you can be a great blessing. You can be a great blessing if you will take God at his word. By living faith, you are to trust him. Even though the impulse is strong within you to speak words of distrust, you can trust him. Peace comes from dependence on, uh, on divine power. As fast as the soul resolves to act in accordance with the light given, the Holy Spirit gives more light and strength. So we've got to depend on what God's given us, and then more strength comes. Um, the grace of the Spirit is supplied to cooperate with the, the soul's resolve, the soul's firm decision. And, but it is not a substitute for the individual exercise of faith. So we have to exercise faith. Success in the Christian life depends upon the appropriation or the making our own, uh, our claiming as a reality by faith whatever God uh, gives us, whatever he gives us. So it is, we have to appropriate, we have to claim it for our own. It is not an abundance of light and evidence that makes the soul free in Christ. It is the rising of the powers and the will and the energies of the soul to cry out sincerely, Lord, I believe. Help thou mine unbelief. Lord, I believe, but help my unbelief. Anyone feel like that? You know, so often, so often, we have an enemy. But we can claim that. And the Lord does help our unbelief. I rejoice in the bright prospects of the future. And so may you. So here's Ellen White in her late 80s. Having served the Lord faithfully. 
having almost died, the devil almost killed her multiple times because she, was, she, she, she chose to obey his voice. Right in the great controversy, the devil wanted to destroy her, but the Lord protected her. Sometimes she was sick in bed for weeks. Unbelievable what she went through. If you study her life, it's unbelievable. It wasn't an easy journey. She lost children, multiple children, died. Over the years, she knew sorrow, she knew heartache. She knew how to comfort those that were sorrowful. She knew how to encourage those that needed encouragement. Even though she spoke, she was one of the a great leader in the temperance movement in the United States in the early, in the turn of the 1900s. She was a sought after speaker. She could speak to 10,000 people without a microphone. But she had such a love for people. And she lived in Napa Valley. The Napa Valley is a great wine, uh, grape growing area. And she would visit the, the, the vineyards, the vineyard owners. And when we were there last summer, uh, we were at a wedding and we went to visit, you know, the Elmshaven and very, very interesting where she lived her last of her life and, and the sanitarium and um, Angwin Sanitarium there. Uh, and she, uh, she would visit and there were all kinds of vineyards and beautiful vineyards, all vines everywhere and uh, these beautiful homes and big mansions and what have you. And she would go on her horse and buggy uh, and go and visit her neighbors and uh, the ones that owned these vineyards and made wine, you know. So she was a speaker against, but she didn't, you know, she hated the sin, but she did not hate those that made the wine. And when she had her funeral, uh, when her funeral, they came in, in droves. They loved her because they knew that she loved them. And who knows what influence her kindness had ultimately in their salvation. You know, so we have to, uh, we have to just let God fill us with love and love everybody, and knowing that He loves everybody and point them to Jesus, no matter where they are, whether they're a terrorist. Many, many terrorists have come to Jesus and laid down their terrorist tools and and allowed Him to change their lives. The Lord, I believe, but. Help my, now my unbelief. He loves and he pities your every weakness. Are you weak? He loves you and he pities that weakness. He understands, he identifies with it. He hath blessed us with all spiritual blessings in heavenly places in Christ Jesus. Ephesians 1.3 It would not satisfy the heart of, in, of the infinite one to give those who love him his son a lesser blessing than he gives his son. That is so cool. You think of the father blessing his son. But he would not think, our heavenly father would not think for even a moment of not blessing us in exactly the same way as he blesses Jesus. When we accept Christ as our savior and accept his righteousness, God looks at us. He doesn't see us as broken sinners anymore. He sees us as his son and as his daughter. That is amazing. That's amazing love that God has for us. He would not, so it would not satisfy the heart of the infinite one, our father, to give those who love his son a lesser blessing then he gives his son. So everything, all the love he pours out on his son, he pours that out on us. All the, you know, all, the, all the spiritual blessings, and he has a place prepared for us to be with him and his son. We'll share the throne with him. Satan seeks to draw our minds away from the mighty helper to lead us to ponder or focus over our degeneration of soul. But through Jesus, but, but though Jesus sees the guilt of the past, he pardons. And, he, and, and we should not dishonor him by doubting his love. The feeling of guiltiness must be laid where? Where should we lay that? Feeling of guiltiness that can just destroy us. 
Where do we lay that? At the foot of the cross. Take it to the cross. Lay it there. You don't own it. And that will ultimately be laid on Satan, who is the one who originated it. Do not allow yourself to be destroyed when Jesus has already redeemed you. You're already redeemed. Redeem how I love to proclaim it. We sang that last week, right, Sharon? That was a song. And we switch it out because that was the message that we needed to hear, that we have been redeemed. And it's the message we need every single day. But though Jesus sees the guilt of the past, he speaks pardon. And we should not dishonor him by doubting his love. We don't want to dishonor Jesus. And it's wonderful to know that we can, we can just receive that love, no matter how bad we may feel. The feelings of guiltiness must be laid at the foot of the cross or it will poison the spring of life. So this feeling of guiltiness has to be laid at the foot of the cross. It'll poison us and we don't own it. It's not ours. It's Jesus. He took it. Praise the Lord. He took it. Even though we doubt that, we question that. Oh no, it can't be. It's too good. It's, God can't love me. That is not true. It will poison the springs of life. When Satan thrust his threatenings upon us, turn from them and comfort your soul with the promises of God. The cloud may be dark in itself, but when filled with the light of heaven, it turns to the brightness of gold. For the glory of God rests upon it. God's children are not to be subject to the to feelings and emotions. Because how, how stable are our feelings and our emotions? It's like a roller coaster. We're like a roller coaster, you know? But God doesn't want us to depend on those. Those are not his promises. When they fluctuate between hope and hope and fear, the heart of Christ is hurt. For he has given them unmistakable, given us unmistakable evidence of his love. He wants them to be established, strengthened, and settled in the most holy faith. Now don't start feeling guilty because you're not believing, you know. I believe, but help my unbelief. You know, he understands that we struggle with these things. But that's where, that's the direction he's going. He's trying to tell us that he loves us so much. And he's forgiven us so much. It just takes a little time for us to get it in our thick skulls or our hearts, you know, because we, we haven't experienced that kind of love and that kind of forgiveness and that kind of grace, you know, from human beings. You know, it's hard to find. It was impossible unless we are so filled with his love. And that's what we need to be, right? So that we are so, we extend love and forgiveness to the most needy in our you know including you know we look in the mirror we have to do it we have to learn to love ourselves to love the God and to love our neighbor as ourselves we got to take care of ourselves by giving by trusting and completely depending and trusting and believing the promises that Jesus has given us he wants to be established strengthened and settled in the most holy faith he wants them to do the work he has given them. Then their hearts will become in his hands as sacred harps, every chord of which will send forth praise and thanksgiving uh, to the one sent by God to take away the sins of the world. That's a beautiful picture, isn't it? So he wants us uh, to do the work he's called us to do, and then their hearts, our hearts, will become in his hands as sacred harps. So as he touches our heart with his love, the chord of love will respond to that love. And it will be like a, he's strumming the chords sent forth. And then out of our hearts will flow praise and thanksgiving to the one sent by God to take away the sins of the world. Christ's love for his children as tender is as tender as it is strong it is strong stronger than death 
for he died to purchase our salvation and to make us one with him mystically and eternally and that word mystically she uses as a, and I looked the definition up spiritual meaning or reality that is uh, neither apparent to the senses nor obvious to the intellect but there's something mystical about it something you know heavenly about it and it's eternal about this idea that he died and to purchase our salvation so strong is his love that it controls all his powers and employs the vast resources of heaven in doing his people good like I like the quote uh, that, that God would empty all of heaven for the weakest of the weakest soul that is struggling that calls upon him he will empty all heaven to come to our rescue there's no sin that, that, that he can't vic give us victory for we've already gained that and he will do whatever it takes if we simply will believe him and claim his promises he loves the he loves the sinless uh, angels who do his service and are obedient to all of his commands but he does not give them grace why does God not give his angels grace his, his obedient angels grace they don't need it they have they 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 have never needed it for they have never sinned grace is an attribute shown to undeserving human beings what's the what's probably one of the most favorite songs in the world amazing grace amazing grace that's a that's a very very favorite song by many people who love that song Grace is an attribute shown to undeserving children. His grace is given to us. We're not deserving. We, need, we, we did not seek after it. It was sent to search for us. Isn't that cool? God's grace searches us out and finds us. God rejoices to bestow grace upon all who hunger and thirst for it. Not because we are worthy but because we are unworthy our need is the is the qualification which gives us the assurance that we shall receive the gift of grace because it's our need that makes that's why we that's why we can be sure of having it because we need it and as long as we as long as we acknowledge that we need it he will give it it should not be difficult to remember that the Lord desires you to lay your troubles and perplexities at his feet and leave them there go to him saying Lord my burdens are too heavy for me to carry will thou bear them for me and he will answer I will take them with everlasting kindness will I I, I have mercy on you I will take your sins I will give you peace give them to him and receive his peace banish or drive out no longer your uh, your fear of not being accepted by the God for I have bought you with the price of my own blood you are mine your, your, your weakened will I will strengthen have you got a weak will I do but he's promised to strengthen our weak will your remorse for sin I will remove praise the Lord I'm going to just uh, uh, let's see here let's see I have some Bible verses I think pretty well done here I think I just have some Bible verses that I wrote out uh, but I think that basically brings these thoughts to the end uh, and the, the Bible verse that I had and there's a number of Bible verses that deal with the blotting out and I'll just read a few of those um, Isaiah 43 25 to 26 I even I am he that blotteth out thy transgressions from my for my own sake and I will not remember your sins these are beautiful promises from God's Word Isaiah 43 25 and 26 put me in remembrance let us plead together declare thou that thou mayest be justified declared righteous by faith in Christ's death his shed blood blot 
a stain, a uh, blot. Okay, so anyway, well, a stain or reproach. Blot out sin is to forgive it. And uh, to blot out sin is to forgive that sin. Isaiah 44, 22. I have blotted out as a thick cloud thy transgressions. And as a cloud thy sins. Return unto me for I have redeemed thee. Isaiah 44, verse 22. And then it's in the past tense. I have redeemed thee. Why? In Romans chapter 5 and verse 8 we read... But God demonstrated his own love towards us in that while we were still what? Sinners, Christ died for us. Jesus died for sinners. It's the only people he could ever die for because there was no, none righteous, no, not one. But God commanded his love towards us that in that while we were yet sinners, Christ died for us. It became mine when I accept it, it becomes mine when I accept it as my own. The price was paid in full, but we only receive the benefit when we receive it by faith. And that is exactly what, in, as we receive by faith what Christ did for us as he shed his blood for you and me. Acts 3, 9, 19. Repent theref ye therefore and, and be converted that your sins may be blotted out when the time of refreshing shall, shall come in the presence of the Lord. So the Lord is all about blotting out our transgressions, blotting them out. He's promised to do this. And the question today is, will I trust him? Isaiah 50, 45, 22. Look to me and be saved all you ends of the earth for I am God and there is none other respond to the calls of God's mercy and say I will trust in the Lord and be comforted I will praise the Lord for his anger is turned away I will rejoice in God who gives the victory do you want to receive that victory today please accept the victory Bring joy to Jesus' heart. What does the Bible say? When one sinner comes to repentance, comes to Christ, when one sinner comes to Jesus, what does the Bible say? All heaven rejoices. So let us let heaven be rejoicing. And let us introduce others to the same God Who's, who has, that has changed our lives and is in the process of changing. He's not done yet, but I'm so thankful that he hasn't, he does not given up on us. And as we just go to Jesus and spend time with him and trust and claim these beautiful promises, I, even I, am he that blotteth out thy transgressions of my, for my own sake, and I will not remember thy sins. Put, your, put me in remembrance. Let us plead together. Declare thou, thou mayest be justified. I have not spoken in secret. In a dark place of the earth. I said not unto the seed of Jacob. Seek ye me in vain. I, the Lord, speak righteousness. I declare things that are right. Look unto me and be saved all the ends of the earth for I am God and there is no other precious Lord thank you that you're a God that's used to taking broken sinners receiving them us and transforming them us and you've already given us the victory we're already in heavenly places in Christ Jesus so Lord, may we claim these beautiful promises. May we not seem to think in our minds that they're for someone else, but not me. Let us not give the devil any satisfaction to discourage us. We're thankful, Lord, for this message that you put on the heart of your servant, your messenger, to be the last words written 
uh, by her uh, in a message of this nature. And Lord, we're thankful we receive them today. May we be encouraged. And as we see the sin that so easily besets us, may we get our eyes off the sin. And may we put them on Jesus. Looking onto Jesus, the author and the finisher of our faith. Thank you, dear Lord, for redeeming us. In your name we pray. Amen.